Let's look at some real journalism, shall we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All that stuff you usually see on this show. <laughs> Uh, yesterday window. we saw the excellent journalism from Lauren Lister on what's going on in Venice and the homeless population down there. And now Project Home Key, which was launched during the pandemic, is helping local governments buy buildings to house some of the homeless considered most at risk for COVID-19. Now Governor Gavin Newsom wants to expand the program to build even more housing. Lauren Lister saw firsthand how the program is working in L.A. County. I'm Brian Griffin. This is my room. This 59-year-old Hawthorne man now has a motel to call home after two years bouncing around shelters and living in his car. I will go to Hawthorne City Hall and clean up my personal hygiene and go back to my car. The father of two and welder by trade says a divorce left him with nowhere to live and not enough money for a place at the same time he was recovering from a major organ transplant. I'm a kidney transplant recipient, so I drink a lot of water. He landed this room through Project Home Key, a state program started during the pandemic, offering money for cities and counties to buy motels and other buildings to house people who are homeless. 36-year-old mother Laura Morales lives here too, saying the stability, including services like counseling, have helped turn her life around after three years on the streets. Sometimes life hits you in a very unexpected way. And not all of us come from a slum background. I'm a surgical tech. I lost my job, lost my car, lost my place. Soon enough, I couldn't take care of my son, which is my biggest regret. She relapsed into drug addiction and fell into homelessness, living on the LA River near a bike path. I perched myself right across the neighborhood where my son would stay. So sometimes I would see him ride by, and I didn't think I was good enough to talk to him because I was in a position in a place where I was ashamed. Wanting help but not knowing where to turn, outreach made the difference. So actually proactive people that came to the river and came to us. The county tells me this was a Motel 6. They bought it for $7.1 million and say it can house 75 people. It's one of 10 buildings the county purchased with home key funding for more than $106 million with a total of nearly 850 rooms, an average of about $125,000 each. Even with costs to renovate into permanent housing, home key is touted as faster than new construction and requiring a lot less money. Roughly about 50% of building new. But USC professor Gary Painter, who focuses on homelessness policy, strikes a note of caution as the economy improves and travel picks up. We don't know the extent to which hotel and motel operators are going to be willing to sell as they were in the middle of the pandemic. We should have a plan B. LA County Home Key properties become permanent housing with supportive services next year. Right now, most provide temporary shelter. Folks will be able to stay here until there's another permanent housing opportunity. In the meantime, Laura Morales is planning a return to work and has reunited with her 14 year old son. I'm glad that my son's forgiven me and understands. The Lord is my strength. And a counselor is helping Brian Griffin get into truck driving school. Now he's focusing on these goals. Get out of here, get on my feet you know, and give back, you know, like I've been given an opportunity to start over. In Baldwin Park, I'm Lauren Lister, KTLA 5 News. And joining us now in studio is Lauren Lister with that uh, really incredible, excellent journalism. Right. Good, very good report. Thanks for Thanks being here. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for having me on to of your show. Of course. Um, yeah, welcome to the Five Live studio. I don't think I've ever made it in here. <laughs> no. Glenn Walker is going to be jealous. Well, <laughs> one of the more uh, serious things to talk about, usually we're just arguing over bananas. And what movies you made out to in high school or whatever so, we but, talked about in the A Block today. Uh, that this sounds is, fun. This is a, 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 big, a part of a big project that you've been working working on. Um, we, we looked at Venice yesterday. We're going to talk about another piece that's coming out tomorrow in a second. But I think when a lot of people see this and, and they know that this is a huge problem in Los Angeles, homelessness at large, right? And they, they think that there's a lot of money being spent. Um, this specific program, we know that Governor Gavin Newsom next year is now going to be getting $7 billion, right? That's the proposal if the governor's budget passes. Yes, he's proposing. Remember that big $12 billion budget announcement for homelessness? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seven billion of that is for sort of a continuation of this home key um, strategy of buying buildings like hotels and motels, but also um, some other facilities that then you use for, for homeless housing. So they sound pretty confident that this is, I mean, that's a big percentage of all of that budget. Yeah, they think right? that this is working. 
Yes, so this is sort of a model that they are obviously trying to invest in a major way in. You know, the idea that it's a lot less expensive to use a building that already exists and convert that into housing than it is to build new construction and also a lot faster. It's an urgent crisis and many people that I've interviewed in this process think that it's not being addressed with nearly enough urgency and mm -hmm. enough action. Mm -hmm. So those are sort of the things that Governor Newsom touts is sort of the cost savings and the speed. Um, but of course it's still expensive, right. um, but compared to like measure HHH for LA City, that is mm -hmm. sort of the measure that is paying for a lot of the permanent supportive housing, right. which is, you know, permanent housing that once someone goes through being homeless and goes through transition is able to get housed successfully, like that's where they stay and there are services, supportive services. So that's a pretty high level of care. Um, to build those units through measure HHH, it's averaging something like over $500,000 right. each. So wow. something like this, um, you know, you heard from Gary Painter is about 50% of the costs, right. even, you know, even with remodeling them, but it's, you know, it's still pretty expensive. This is fascinating to me. So we were talking about how this gets funded and I was wondering like these hotels or motels that go out of business, do they keep the staff? Cause we saw housekeeping come and help clean the room, but explain how that works. Cause that's a homeless services group that's getting money from the state or the city and they are taking care of these facilities. It, well, yes, exactly. So, you know, the, the city or county has bought, purchased these properties right. with help from the home key funding or whatnot that, that was available in 2020. But then there's, yes, a contracted homeless services provider that then operates the facility and provides the counseling and that sort of thing. And that's sort of a separate well, that is a separate contract. And to give you an idea, so most of the county properties that I looked at, we looked at a county property okay. and they purchased 10. And so all of them are going to be converted into permanent housing with services. Right, right. now, most of them are bridge housing, interim housing, right. sort of this transitional uh, housing for people that are trying to get into permanent housing. Um, but one is converted already, or one is already permanent supportive. And the cost per room to operate it and on an annual basis is around $23,000. And a year, that is a, a year, a year yeah. per room. Per and, room. Um, and that is offset by you know some vouchers and that sort of thing, but it gives you right. a sense of like, there is major money involved. Mm -hmm. right. but, but to Sam's question, uh, some of these hotels that they are allocating for this housing, are, are, are they, is it because they are going out of business that they sold the actual property? Or is the city just saying, hey, you're gonna make more money if you sell wholesale right now, the, your whole business, as opposed to continuing to rent out these rooms to possible uh, tourists or people who just need a, a temporary place to stay. And in addition to that, the guy said this out of the box thinking is great, but uh, with the co with COVID, the COVID pandemic coming to an end, these hotels might be needed for uh, tourist purposes. So, so yes. is that gonna be so, an issue down the line? So I'm glad you asked that because that is absolutely a question. You know, the strategy worked well, they say, you know, during the pandemic, right? because you know, business was not strong in right. travel and tourism. So yeah. some of these motel hotel operators were willing to offload these properties at the price that we're talking about that makes this desirable to the people trying to do these housing projects. But yeah, does that but dynamic now, change yeah. as everything picks up? You know, yeah. and he calls for a plan B. And it's interesting because I spoke with the governor's uh, kind of chief homelessness uh, official today, and he was saying, we have a plan B. One of the big areas that they also are, are proposing to invest in is what are called board and cares. What maybe in a prior time would have been referred to as a halfway house, but that's not what they're called anymore. Right, right. But it's this higher level of care yeah. and some of these facilities that provide an even, you know, a level of care for people that mm. are much more seriously, you know, mentally ill or struggling. Right. And that is included in what they are uh, proposing to invest in. So with the permanent housing, is there the assumption that people will want to move out. Like once they get enough fun, let's say they're there for three to five years or whatever. I don't know if there's a limit. Is there a limit? Um, is there the idea that they will eventually leave or how will they continue to fund that for people who just stay? Like, is there gonna be a rent check that needs so to So for a lot of permanent supportive housing there, yeah, yes, people pay some of their, yeah. you know, if they're on disability or social security, you Got know, it. or have a job. Yes, some of their okay. income goes towards that and there's I'm sure all sorts of ways that that's calculated and figured out. Yeah. Okay. And then I, you know, the estimations, obviously we didn't have a census last year for the homeless count because- Right, the homeless count was canceled because we, of the pandemic. So early 2020 are the numbers that we last have that are official. 70, so, something like 70,000. Yeah. yeah, over 66,000 in LA County. This is a lot of eggs in the basket of Project Home Key. How many people do you think in LA County are gonna be helped by this in its current? I mean, are, are we making a dent, so, I guess? I mean, it, look, it's so, 66,000 is so many people. When you talk to officials, 
you know, like Gary Painter, who's, you know, he's a professor and he focuses on this. He says, you know, not everybody needs this type of thing. There are other voucher programs and subsidies and, you know, rapid rehousing that helps people just do that first and last month's rent. And, yeah. and, you know, there are different things that can help different people. So maybe the best way to think about it is not like this is the answer for 66,000 people or that that's what they're anticipating. Um, but as far as the budget, you know, it's not clear how much of the governor's budget yet would go to L.A. County. Mm. Estimates I've heard would be maybe a third. So that's still a lot of money. I mean, it could still make a dent for for perspective um, right now with the 34 properties in L.A. County it seems there are about 2,100 units, according to the data that I've seen. What is the plan as far as once people get into these of transitioning into something else, more permanent housing, or is this this is going to be it for a little while? So the home keys, once they're permanent supportive housing, that is permanent housing. The idea is that is housing for people that are, you know, that's where they will live. They'll have kitchens and that's part of the remodeling and that sort of thing. For the, if it's a, a temporary or interim shelter right. or whatnot, that would be where someone stays until they're able to get permanent housing and figure that out. Mm. That is sort of a difficulty in right. LA County where there's a, a shortage right. of affordable housing. And right. a lot of the advocates or the people that work in outreach I've been speaking to just say that it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm that's glad you brought up an first and last because a lot of the conversation is, well, how can they not afford X amount? There are low income housing available, but there is low income housing available. But the challenge of getting, you know, X amount, thousands of dollars for a first and last can be a huge hurdle. And a hundred percent. And so that is something that, you know, you, you saw from the gentleman in my story, mm -hmm. uh, Bryant Griffin, he was saying, you know, he fell on hard times in his case, a kidney transplant mm. and his wife divorcing him at the same time and you know recovering from that surgery and not being able to pay rent and he said you know i couldn't get a place i couldn't come up with first right. last yeah. secure i couldn't come up with that chunk of money you know and so I mean, he fell on really it a lot of money coming yeah. out of either college or whatever and trying after their first job they're making not a lot of money first I and last know. is hard it, for it completely is there are programs there's something called rapid rehousing that sort of helps with that um, but it is definitely, you know, an example of the challenges yeah. for what those people that have fallen on hard times that aren't chron necessarily chronically homeless or that right. sort of thing. I would say, what have you learned? And because we have a couple more so stories coming up. So much. What's oh like my a gosh. couple of takeaways from your reporting? So much. So, I mean, this is sort of something you always hear said that homelessness is so complex and everybody's stories are different and that's definitely something that is just resonant mm -hmm. um, talking to different people you know of course there are the examples that you see in those videos in Venice where right. it's clear that substance abuse or mental illness or some issues are going on that yeah. are you know very low functioning for those people but then you meet people like in the project home key people that I spoke to that you know they're they've turned their lives around and they obviously were on the streets because they hit some really hard times a big through line and a lot of people that I've interviewed from Skid Row to Venice to this story, drug addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Drug addiction, substance abuse, alcoholism. Today I was just at a veteran's home because I'm working on a veteran story too. And that was, you know, all people that mainly when they, the, the few people that I interviewed there that were examples, there were people that fell on hard times yeah. largely because of substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you feel like the state or at least the programs locally are doing a good job, or I, I don't know if that's even a fair question, are, are considering the percentages of people who maybe, like you said, are, are have fallen on hard times, or people who are also, also have substance abuse issues, or like the people who we talked about in Venice. Um, like I said, this is, there's a lot of money going towards people and housing and, and putting people in houses, but what about the mental health services, the treatment of substance abuse issues? Are we, are, are we seeing programs like that uh, ramping up as well? So one of the things I've learned through my reporting is that there's the policy focus in California is called housing first. And the idea is that you get people into housing and then drug treatment, mental illness treatment, that that comes after. Mm. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you aren't required to be sober or be drug tested or anything for these programs. The you a are lower you, barrier. You're not. To, you're, not, you're, not. Okay, you're not tested. Okay. And there's a lower barrier to entry and the idea of more people getting helped that way. Uh, but that said, you know, when you talk to a, a Los Angeles Homeless Services outreach worker, they say that there are services that they're connecting people on the streets with for mental illness mm -hmm. and, and 
a substance abuse all the time. And like in this program, you know, you heard the woman say, you know, that the woman who was addicted to, she was addicted to meth. Yeah. She oh, was addicted gosh. to meth. She said, you know, the things you don't think about. Why was she addicted to meth? She was living on the streets. Night is the most dangerous time to sleep. Right. Or, yeah, to sleep. And so meth keeps you up. Mm. Yeah. Meth keeps your hunger at bay Threat. when you don't have yeah. secure yeah. food. Yikes. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's, and it's so things I hadn't thought about before. Mayor yeah. Garcetti has a list on his website of the how we got here in regards to the homeless crisis. And substance abuse is not one of the five reasons. And it's oh, interesting. People say that it's linked into mental health. And he mentions mental health. But like yourself, a lot of people who are on the streets working with homeless uh, people and advocates and groups, they all say the same thing, that they? drugs, it's drugs, it's drugs, it's drugs. And um, when I was working in Palm Springs, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the sleeping at night is the uh, most unsafe. The problem was that women were getting assaulted mm -hmm. so much living on the street alone with no housing, no care, and they were scared to sleep at night. And that's mm -hmm. so, I'm glad you brought that up. But now we're seeing that women are turning to meth to stay awake at night because they're so scared to sleep alone in the dark on the streets. This is such a huge, drugs yeah, are intertwined in so many mm -hmm. different ways. And I just wonder, is there gonna be a focus on that? Because yeah. we're talking about housing shortage, that's right. everyone knows that right. housing, housing, housing. What about drugs? Well, and if yeah. they are, if it's not addressed, what happens to these places then, where people have permanently lived and they're still, do they become then magnets for people who are pushing drugs and who are looking Ooh. for vulnerable people to then go there? And then what does that do to yeah. the community? I mean, is it just we have a, there people are not intense, but they're still suffering. They're just not on the sidewalks. Is that okay? I mean, and I you see, you do see, you know. I've seen. I haven't dug into that issue. I haven't really gotten into the permanent supportive oh, housing. Oh, it's not like you've been busy or yet. anything with Skid Row, <laughs> Venice, but, Home Key. No, but it is an interest. Really, I have read reporting on what you're talking about. You know that others have done that say that is an yeah, issue. I mean, for, just for, how can for that many, not, for some, you know, that are because you're not addressing the illness. underlying issue too. Right. If you don't have the support for people who need this, it's just I. I don't, and maybe the support. I don't. I don't really. I can't speak. You know you know, in a very educated way about exactly what services are available yeah. in addressing mental illness or drug addiction. Um, drug addiction right, but right. I just do know big picture. That's always you know, the, the housing line. first um, things. But, but for example, you know, yeah. today I was at a veteran's home that yeah. is they, where they offer drug treatment. And, you know, the people that I spoke to there mm -hmm. were there for drug addiction, you yeah. know, a really, you know, a story of a veteran who was young, 32, mm. became addicted to meth because he said in Arkansas, everyone that he knows and is close with is on it. Mm. And mm. his dad cooks it. Uh. And it was just, you know, with certain triggers in his life, he turned to it right. and it developed a horrible addiction, lost everything and ended up with, you know, his last thousand dollars living in his car to get to where he could get treatment. For veterans, there are a lot of options. That's mm -hmm. an area that's been really invested in. Mm -hmm. And that's an area when you look at the LA, greater LA homeless count, that number is stable. Mm -hmm. And that's attributed to, you know, because the other numbers are rising. Right. And that's attributed to all of the resources that have been poured into veterans homeless services. Good. That's a good thing. So that's, right? you know, that's an interesting point. And I'm working on that story. That'll I'll come talk to you when that one's oh, out. All right. all right. Well, thank you for enlightening us so, so much. Um, tomorrow, you're going to be uh, doing a story about Skid Row. Tell yes. us about that. So Skid Row is the epicenter of homelessness right. in L.A. County. It's it's one of the you know places that you think of in the country right. when it comes to homelessness. And it has persisted for decades in that way. Um, back in the 70s, you know, people that work in homelessness say there was an unofficial containment zone policy where it was sort of agreed upon that this was where the homeless would be concentrated and homeless services would be concentrated. And you this know, is just where the dumping example. conversations came from, right? That, yes, yeah. there were, you know, hospital dumping, which has, mm -hmm. you know, really, they've cracked down on that mm -hmm. and there have been major efforts in that area, but in the past, yes. And we spoke to Reverend Andy Bales. He runs the Union Rescue Mission downtown, so that's one of the shelters emergency shelter, they offer meals, they're serving the people at Skid Row. He's been there for 16 years. Wow. He developed a flesh eating disease from oh. human waste on the streets of Skid uh, Row right. uh. and has had to, in the years since, have both legs amputated. Oh my, God. oh my goodness. So here, there he is. So there's a man that has experienced firsthand the hazards of Skid Row mm -hmm. and he is very appalled that this sort of devastation in people's lives has been able to persist like this. He's wow. one who says, 
this is an emergency. There needs to be a FEMA-like immediate response. Yeah. There needs to be creativity, you know, mobile homes, yeah. tiny homes, sprung shelters. He is opposed to this, you know, emphasis on spending on these very expensive permanent housing mm -hmm. units when there's mm -hmm. so many people on the streets that need shelter right now. So he is a big supporter of the federal judge, David O. Carter's order. Right. Right. He's overseen that sweeping lawsuit dealing with homelessness here. October, mm -hmm. right? And he set this deadline, yeah, yeah, ordered for all homeless to be offered yeah. shelter by fall. The city and county are appealing. There are totally mixed reviews to what he's doing within um, homeless advocates, you mm -hmm. know, that I've read and that that uh, Reverend Bales references. Um, mm -hmm. He's one who just thinks, you know what? get a roof over everybody's head and then let's see because that's the most humane thing to do. Wow. So that's his position and you'll hear wow, from him wow, wow. in Was it story. the woman in Venice who said we need to treat this like triage? Yes. Is and that the word she used? She did. She yeah. says this needs to be triaged. And yeah. for some of the people that I've been interviewing in these communities, that's emergency, triage, disaster, FEMA-like response. Those are things that I keep hearing from people that feel this needs to be more it, urgently addressed. It's, it looks like a crisis. It looks like a, a crisis. It is a crisis, it's, but it looks like a you know. Yeah, I hate to say third world crisis, but it, it looks it like it looks like yeah what you would expect to see in a developing nation, not right. the United States. Yeah, and it's a. I mean, it's, it's a, a health tragedy. It's a, it's a civil rights, a human rights disaster yeah. in every yeah. possible way, and and obviously it is very complicated. But we, I have a uh, question. Yeah. What are you doing Memorial Day weekend? Any plans? <laughs> <laughs> What's Lauren Lister doing exhausted, on her free time? I am exhausted, and yeah. I am going away. Oh. oh yes, I'm going away. My sister's getting married, so hey. she. So this is a little girls' weekend. Oh, Good congratulations! For you. That's yeah. great. Fun. Yeah. Palm Spring. All right. Oh, oh, you're nice. stomping well, around. Cool. My hometown. Yeah, yeah, lots of fun. Lauren Lister, thank you so much. You guys, thanks for having me. Yeah. Stop by and talk to us about other stuff sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. We'll I can talk about, about bananas. We'll do, we'll do yeah, talk about whatever you were to play yeah. for. talking about. Yeah, play for Jeopardy's top banana. I, I love Jeopardy. Okay. Oh do you guys play Jeopardy I, here? Yeah, we, we do. We did. And I love Jeopardy. Love. Who you have do you be, want to take over out of your top favorite guest host? So like I don't have the most educated opinion on that because I, to be honest, I watch Jeopardy every single night as a kid. Uh -huh. I don't watch it every single night now. So mm. well, none of the ones that I saw the was, same, was I that done. obsessed with. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, I feel I think like the cadence is really important with the host. That is so, and so crazy. That's exactly what you were saying yesterday. Aaron Rodgers was so bad. <laughs> he had no cadence. He was very slow. And you're like, get the board. We want to finish the board. So many times we go to first break and not finish the board. I'm like, oh my God. It's <laughs> she gets really deep. I mean, she's sending notes to the EP as we Michael speak. Richards. I'm she's like, emailing no. the ABC uh, television executives. No. Who do you guys like? I, I'm holding out for LeVar Burton. I want to see how he does. I just say for yes. one time, give Pat Sajak a chance. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, let him just no. the walk ultimate across the hallway. Different crowd. No, different you're right. Crowd. That's definitely true. Different audience. That's oh, funny because I don't audience. like Wheel of Fortune. I like, I'm I such hate, a I'm Jeopardy fan. I'm not a fan, fan of Wheel of Fortune I can't at all. Watch it. I, I, I don't, yeah. I'm like, how do people do this with one letter? I don't know. I agree. I'm like, this is... This I don't like it, bogus. and I'm not even good at it. At least that's at Jeopardy, why we don't I, like it. I, because we're but not how are you guys' <laughs> Jeopardy skills? Because mine Amazing. have gone way downhill over the years. You guys start yeah, watching. No, I, I, In my 20s, I was like, bah, 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 bah. and now I'm like, it, 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 it. you yeah. need to get what yeah. we all need. Whatever Glenn's taken. Oh yeah, well, well Glenn, Glenn, like, to boom, be boom, fair, boom, boom, boom. one of the whole categories Glenn Walker was about, is good at Jeopardy. Well, one of the categories was about Glenn Walker at Jeopardy. We heard it here. The uh, LA's Clip top it. banana is now in dispute, yeah. or at least in contention. There's been a challenger. You, you got saw like it here a first. Logan Paul. I have yet <laughs> to win it one time. Okay, so I do this every single day. Yeah, you're not good at it. All righty. <laughs> Unless you do sports categories, is that why Glenn does a good? Job? It was Glenn. The well, one of the categories was Glenn, was Glenn oh. Walker. So he was like, so he got so ahead on that. So you make up the questions and answers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. We were playing. I don't know if I'll Jeopardy. do well at your guys' Jeopardy. I'm sure you will. We'll get a Lauren yeah. Lister category. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. A Lauren Lister list. Ah! Okay, we're back in two minutes, thirty seconds. Thanks, Lauren. We'll see Thanks, you soon. Bye. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks.